Hey everyone, back again. Today I want to talk about a conversation between Deleuze and Foucault from 1972 titled Intellectuals in Power. And this is going to usher in a series, I do, a series of episodes on Foucault's lectures at the Collège de France, which I've never actually read. I know, I've just read segments. Never actually read in their entirety, so I'm going to start from number one, work till the end, and it'll be great. So subscribe and you'll see those as they come out. It'll be it'll be excellent. Yeah, before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, like, share, subscribe. You can see videos I release every single week, sometimes twice a week. There's like 300 episodes already up. Lots of stuff for you to listen to. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts, all under the same name. So it should be easy to find. If you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video on YouTube. If you want to see video. You can follow me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal. Links for all these things in the descriptions. And yeah, let's jump into this short conversation, yet a super important one between Deleuze and Foucault from 1972. Now I'm doing this because a few weeks ago I released an episode on Gayatri Spivak's criticism of Deleuze and Foucault. And I said there, that I hadn't realized that this text, her text was drawing upon this interview, which I hadn't read before, and which was which was bad. Uh, so now I'm covering it because I went and read it in order to do that episode and it's super informative. Now this is a conversation in the actual, I keep calling it an interview. It's a conversation between Foucault and Deleuze. So I'm gonna just recount what they say, you know, go like this is what Foucault said, this is what Deleuze said, in order to be as clear and methodical as possible. Now, the subject of this conversation was to consider the place of theory alongside and practice within large-scale social movements, specifically the workers' struggle. And it begins with Foucault recounting how a Maoist was talking to him and said, you know, I really understand how Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, fits with our project, I really understand how you, Foucault, fit within our project in that you talk about confinement, and that is quite relevant to Maoist claims. However, the Maoist said, I don't know how Deleuze fits here. Deleuze is just purely an enigma. To which Deleuze replies to Foucault, Foucault recounting this conversation he had with the Maoist, where Deleuze says that the reason for that might be that he and Guattari were problematizing the very distinction between theory and practice that some Maoists hold to be quite rigid. To say that on the one side there's theory and on the other side there's practice. Theory is what is done in universities and cigar lounges and coffee shops, whereas practice is what's actually happening in the streets. Now, in opposition to that, Deleuze proposes that he and Guattari were imagining not theory against practice or that they are separate. Instead, he was trying to imagine, they were trying to imagine a theory as actional and a practice as actional. And the way that he characterizes it is that theory steps in to help practice when practice hits a wall and practice helps in to, steps in to help theory when theory hits a wall. So if theory can't think any farther, it can the people thinking it, can pursue real action that will demand more theorizing. People doing practice might confront a barrier in how they are to proceed, at which point they need to start theorizing. So what happens here is that there's this very steady give and take between the two. Now to really get into the nitty gritty of it, Deleuze looks at an example that Foucault does within Madness and Civilization and Discipline and Punish. These texts where Foucault very eloquently, I think, lends a voice to people who are confined. So people who are considered mentally ill, people who are uh, considered to be delinquents, uh, who are institutionalized within prisons, who are seen to be criminals. Foucault lends a voice to them. Now about this, Deleuze says, Foucault did this, and it was a practical move on his part, and it opened up the possibility for more theorizing because these people were giving Foucault their theories without calling them theories per se. But what that did 
was it extended the possibility of Foucault's own theorizing by doing this action. However, if you really think about it, what he actually did wasn't really practical in any way. Like He wasn't organizing a revolution in any sort of way. And so what Deleuze is trying to get across here is just how delicate the distinction between theory and practice really is, where practical move is often going to be informed by theory to such an extent that they are going to be indissociable from one another, indissociable, inseparable from one another. And so he imagines theory as operating as a relay within practice to help it move along, as I said earlier, to help it get past the wall. Similarly, practice is an element within theory that helps it move along as a relay within theory to help push it along. And so each one of us, and so therefore any social movement, is going to be comprised of multiplicities of theories and multiplicities of actions that are all working in tandem to arrive at some end. And it is this holistic balance between the two that Deleuze and Guattari were trying to really emphasize that was maybe alien to the Maoist. And that's, you know, him, him setting the stage for how he characterizes this distinction between theory and practice. To which Foucault responds, that in all of this we can see how the role of the intellectual has transformed. Where historically, the, you know, many centuries before this point, before the early 70s, the role of the intellectual was to call attention to the emperor's not wearing any clothes, to say, like, power is over there, everyone. Uh, I'm speaking for all of you. We know that the bad people are up there in their castle. It's so easy. We can just overthrow them, and then that's it. Whereas within the 20th century and a little bit before, before that, the role of the intellectual became a little bit more opaque. And the very operations that the intellectual was participating in even though they might assume a very radical form at times, are actually complicit with a broader systemic shift to new forms of power and control. So for instance, within the 17th and 18th century, there was a burgeoning literature of coding, of mapping, of understanding, of really pinning down the mysteries of consciousness, of the human body, of justice, of truth. And over time, this practice became more commonplace across other institutions to make people more manageable, to make people more codifiable, to make people more docile. So if an intellectual participates in any social movement and what they are doing is imposing another rigid hierarchy upon a social movement, trying to code that social movement, even if it's for the better of the social movement in their mind, they are nevertheless replicating the same system. They are keeping the same rigid system in place that works with power to render people coded, to codify them, to render them docile. So it is the task of the intellectual to oppose these tendencies within intellectual life now that, you know, has this history coming back a few hundred years, to oppose these tendencies now. And it's in that way that he suggests that theory is itself a kind of practice, really piggybacking off of what Deleuze said, that you know, there's, it's like more of a spectrum between theory and practice, where theory is itself a kind of practice here because just by theorizing not to participate in these hegemonic systems, they are participating, they're conducting a kind of action that will actually be beneficial to a social movement in its, in its acting. Now to this point, Deleuze agrees to say that the role of theory is not to be totalizing. It shouldn't be to say that there's this homogenous mass of people that are experiencing homogenous form of oppression against by this homogenous oppressor. Instead, you have to account for the various multiplicities, the different local struggles that people go through, and the types of resistances that they will embrace by virtue of these multiplicities, by their local arrangements. And this is why Foucault adds that he really wanted to allow prisoners or the mentally ill people to speak within these settings because they were giving these localized accounts of their experiences with power. And he says, he kind of really meditates on this for a moment to say that, well, what's interesting as well here is the fact that despite 
the way that these people are characterized as being totally marginal to a normative, to the regular social body as being totally outside of it, they were still incredibly intelligible to everybody outside of the prison or outside of the mental asylum. And this adduced, this, this was evidence for Foucault of the fact that these people were not living in a totally different world than people on the outside. They were living in an intensified world that everyone else was living in, a microcosm of the power structures that everybody lived in because that was power within the prison, Foucault suggests that that is power reduced to its like bare form. Like it's just stripping people of their identities, feeding them almost nothing, just torturing people, which is like the crudest form of power in its possible operations. But it is nevertheless still what goes on outside of prisons, but to a much lesser extent and to a much broader extent. So it's not quite as localized and harsh it is more broad, fuse, and by virtue of that is able to bring in more people. And that also explains why there are so many other possibilities for revolt and for opposition, because it spread itself so so thin. So Deleuze, now piggybacking on Foucault's shoulders, suggests that this is why schools resemble prisons. Within prisons, people are reduced to the status of children. They are just made to be to completely subordinate to powerful people have no will of their own, no agency, nothing. And very similarly, children are reduced to this status. They're reduced to the status of like prisoners because they are not allowed to have an identity. They aren't allowed to have opinions. Anything that they might say is just written off as something a child would say. They're just kids. Or anything they might do is like, well, this is part of their formation to be a proper adult. They have to learn what's right and wrong. And then they're going to be a good, properly socialized citizen for the world. All of these are regulatory mechanisms that are meant to shape people in certain ways to better fit within a mold, to fit within a certain societal paradigm. And the same can really be said about workers in a factory, like reducing their, you know, any kind of creativity they might be able to bring to the table, just getting rid of all that, even if it happened to be good for business, you know, just getting rid of all that, making it so that people are just completing one mundane task at a time and just doing that task repeatedly over and over and over again for ever until they get retirement if they even get there now with all of this foucault says that it, it, it's no surprise that popular revolts and resistances to power don't necessarily assume the former don't necessarily let a more perfect vision of the world guide them they aren't necessarily saying when they oppose justice or when they oppose in, injustice they aren't necessarily saying and we know exactly what justice needs to look like. We, we know how to do it right. So we're gonna take it over for that way, you know, to make that real, to make that happen. And that does happen, like people do have been guided by these beliefs. But Foucault also leaves room to account for the ways that people just want to revolt against power because it is a determining system. It's one that constantly tells people how to live, how to act, how to be in the world, and there's like a kind of release that can come from just opposing that. And in an age where power is really quite global, as I said, really quite stretched out, local resistances really assume the most radical opposition to these totalizing regimes. Because if you just try to oppose a totalizing regime with another totalizing regime, all you'd hope to do is just shift power, like power from one person's hands or one group's hands to another, which isn't really helpful when we want to create a more equitable world, if that is, I mean, who wouldn't want that? But in any case, we're gonna run into barriers if we just seek to replace some leaders with other leaders. And interestingly, there's, there's a lot of this that resonates with Fanon's work in The Wretched of the Earth that I've covered as well. But if anyone's listening and they're like, oh, that, you know, that reminds me of the local struggles that Fanon lays out in The Wretched of the Earth, then I think you'd be totally right. Now, our inability to actually understand how power works might be hindering our possible recognition of the value of the power within, and I'm using that term ironically, within local movements. We are just obsessed with characterizing power as this monolithic thing that can be easily tumbled, you know, like a David and Goliath type situation for any religious people, any cr Christian people out there or and many, yeah, but there's obviously a problem here because how are you going to actually 
at least this is something that Deleuze raises, how are you going to actually identify revolutionary struggle if you don't, you, you don't want to give it like a name, which can then serve as a totalizing principle that is just going to completely encapsulate it and all of its possibilities. To which Foucault says that maybe the answer is not necessarily to make this name prescriptive, but to acknowledge that there are these very broad forms of oppression, like capitalism, for example, that exploit people for their labor. To acknowledge that this is common across many different people, many different communities, many different nations, but the types of resistance and the, op the alternatives that they might offer are going to be widely different. And out of them might come out totally, you know, totally different outcomes. And it's important to respect that and not to lay a possible end goal that you know, can't be varied at all, can't be changed, to use that as a template. So they're suggesting instead to acknowledge that there are these oppressions that work against many different people, and it can be acknowledged as such, but the actual ways to oppose it are going to vary radically from community to community. Now, Deleuze closes this off here to say that, and this is why, like all revolutionary struggles have to be brought back to the workers' struggle, which is a weird point to finish off on, uh, because within like Deleuze and Guattari's work, they you know they allocated so much time to discussing the oppression of psychoanalysis that does you know have its place within the capitalist economy, and then you have Foucault who writes about all these other institutions at play. So it's strange that this is the point that they decide to end on. But in any case. The worker struggle if that's what they're saying is like the number one thing to go after then th i mean that's that's what they say so in any case if you listened this far i hope you got something out of this i hope you liked it uh if there's anything i got wrong i'd love to hear about it anything i excluded i'd love to hear about it if you like what i did like share subscribe yeah catch you next time take care